Hey again, everybody. This is Josh from Silka, and welcome to this episode two of Marginal Gains TV. Today's topic, one of my favorites, asymmetry. So what is uh, asymmetry? I guess we should start with symmetry. So there's really two key types of symmetry, and that is, I think, the way we normally think of it, uh, what's known as bilateral symmetry, right? Same left as it is on the right. Uh, some of you may have noticed I have what I like to call a face for radio. Uh, my face is a bit asymmetric about the center line. Uh, left side is not the same as the right side. Um, that's bilateral symmetry. So things with classic bilateral symmetry we have right here, uh, absolutely epic, the Taj Mahal, right? Um, bilateral symmetry is a beautiful thing, very comfortable to our brains, and it tends to be the way that our brains kind of put the world together uh, when we otherwise lack the full information. We tend to assume uh, symmetry in a lot of cases. The other one's interesting, and it, and it fits our, um, uh, our hobby, our passion, quite well, and that's called radial symmetry. Uh, radial symmetry is a, you know, a bicycle wheel. Right, it's it's uh, symmetric radially uh, around a central hub. So you think of a front wheel uh, has symmetry uh, both from the side view, like here we have left right uh, and also top bottom bilateral symmetry. Uh, we also have radial symmetry. But then if we look at a front wheel head on, we still have left right symmetry. Rear wheel is different. You've got the radial symmetry. Um, and you've got bilateral symmetry in the side view, but in the fore-aft view, uh, you can see here, it's no longer uh, bilaterally symmetric. So that is, uh, I guess, some quick definitions and terms there. We talked about the Taj Mahal, and let's look at some other buildings. Here's the Parthenon, um, which is a great example, and also the, let's look at the U.S. Capitol building. You'll notice uh, throughout history, traditionally, big, imposing government buildings, uh, monuments uh, built to memorialize historic events, um, wars, the dead, uh, things that are meant to have gravitas, right? Those are all structures that are generally created uh, using a lot of bilateral symmetry. Uh, and also things like domes, right, that have uh, the, this radial symmetry component. This is because of the way our brains uh, think about and respect the symmetric, right? It's, it, it seems big, grand, imposing. Um, it's actually quite easy to use uh, certain architectural and design techniques in these structures to make them look even bigger and grander uh, than they may actually measure out to be. Um, uh, the Parthenon's an interesting example here of how they've actually, uh, you know, it looks like a pretty rectangular building, but there's not a single straight line in the Parthenon. They've softened it with gentle, gentle curves, um, but it's a huge scale, very symmetric. Our brains like that. Now, the flip side of this, and you think of this comes into play also when we talk about, you know, actors, actresses, models, um, is that while symmetric... Uh, is delightful to our brain and is comforting to our brain, asymmetric is interesting to our brain. And so um, it's quite interesting that a lot of famous, uh, say, supermodels, actors, actresses, uh, ones that are maybe not the, the most classically beautiful, uh, tend to have some sort of asymmetry about them that makes them very interesting to look at. Um, we won't point any of them out, but that you can read. There's tons of articles, research papers, um, things written on this. But let's talk architecture here. And this is one of my all-time favorites. This is the uh, Zaha Hadid put this structure together. And just look at the beautiful, I mean, that is stunning asymmetry, right? And you can see that unlike our symmetric buildings, uh, this one's really something you could look at for a while. You could take a good 10, 15, 20 minutes just really kind of figuring the details out. Your brain is automatically intrigued uh, by the asymmetry of this, of this structure. So we talk a lot about uh, how our brains work, right? A lot about uh, kind of the psychological. And, and as we go on, we'll get into some of the sociological um, aspects of marginal gains, because that all becomes really important uh, as we start to really get to the truth um, in a lot of these topics. 
So, one of the ways that I like to start talking about asymmetry um, is time. And if you think about it, time um, time is asymmetric, right? It only goes in the one direction. So if we draw a timeline, time always goes out to the right. Uh, it can never go backwards. And that's sort of baked into our universe uh, from the very beginning. Think of the Big Bang, right? This, uh, this inflation from nothing, essentially. Um, that created what, what's commonly known as the, the, among scientists as the thermodynamic asymmetry of time. Um, these are the things that you don't think about until you do, and then you see them everywhere. You know, one of my favorites is to think about uh, uh, brewing coffee, right? That as you brew the coffee, the aroma of the coffee will spread throughout the room, but it can never be put back in. Um, you know, this comes back to haunt us in thermodynamics with things like uh, internal combustion engines uh, that have these really low peak efficiencies. You know, the peak efficiency for a, a Carnot cycle engine, something like 40%. Uh, best case, right, with frictionless, I mean, all these things that, that could never happen. And a lot of that is due to this thermodynamic asymmetry uh, that is baked into the universe. So, you know, we think about why this matters to us? Well, this matters to us uh, in a ton of ways, largely in that a lot of the losses that we're looking to optimize, uh, and I am not a physiologist, but a lot of our internal, the way we burn calories, the way we breathe, the way our muscles work, um, those are all limited by really interesting asymmetric uh, effects, but also all the things that we're trying to, uh, to grapple with uh, on the bicycle itself, on the technology side, those are similarly asymmetrically limited. So things like friction, um, you know, friction is is the, the relative movement of parts rubbing and that you're losing that to heat. That heat cannot be put back into that, uh, into that object. So the friction, uh, the, the heat generated by, say, the chain moving through your drivetrain, there's no way to capture that and put that back in. Uh, the best we can do is limit how much goes out. Um, same thing with rolling resistance in tires. And this is really where this starts to get interesting. You know, I think we, we tend to think rather symmetrically in the same way that we think linearly about a lot of these things. You know, I, I always like to use weight as the example that if we think about taking our system and we take some weight out of it, you know, losing 100 grams, gaining 100 grams, that feels that's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty linear and a pretty symmetric cost benefit. Uh, you know, take 100 grams off, you're, you climb a little bit faster, add 100 grams, you climb a little bit slower. And that really scales out uh, as the weight goes. You know, if you, you take that to a kilogram and, and the effect is very easily calculable and relatable. Now, that comes to bite us, that thinking comes to bite us when we start looking at tire pressure because uh, you have an interesting asymmetry that happens out in the tire pressure model. And th this is something really we've only known about for the last maybe 10 years. Um, and we were fortunate enough to be on the cutting edge of discovering this uh, back in the 2008 through 10 period uh, when I was working to develop carbon wheels to, to finish at and then ultimately win at Roubaix and we started finding these asymmetric data points um, that really confused us and then turned out to be quite quite a weapon that we could use to our advantage in, uh, in pro racing. And uh, as with all things like this, eventually the cat is out of the bag and now we're sharing it with, uh, with everybody and it's something you can take advantage of. So let's take a look at asymmetry in this tire pressure context. So here is my basic uh, calculated tire rolling resistance curve, right? So this is what, uh, you know, we have an equation you put in, the construction, the uh, kind of rough um, uh, expectation of the construction of the tire, the roller diameter, et cetera, et cetera, and we get this, this curve. Now, when we go into the lab, we put a tire on, we test it, and we get this curve. And you see the two overlay almost perfectly. That's really a result of, you know, a hundred years of people refining the mathematical model to match the data. Okay, so this is why we say the math works. Uh, you know, you can give me a tire, we can mathematically model it. Beautiful stuff. So we have the theoretical, we have the lab data, and then we go into the real world and we start testing 
uh, with these high precision power meters, high precision GPS. We're using the Chung method uh, that we'll, we'll get to later and we'll even have an interview with Robert uh, Chung, the founder of the, the creator of the method uh, coming up. There's one in the podcast if you want to check it out. But we go out into the real world and we start testing and we get this, which was a surprise, I gotta be honest. Um, you know, we've got, I think, 80 years uh, plus, 100 years plus, right, in cycling of us all believing that higher pressure tires went faster. Um, and then we see that at some point they don't, right? And so what's happening here is there is a fundamental asymmetry in the behavior of the tire, and it's because the tire isn't just the tire, it's in the bike and rider system. So we talk about the left-hand side of our curve here being the tire casing losses. Now, when we look at the testing that we do on these tires, we realize that tires are an incredibly efficient uh, device, right? And especially as we get really into the weeds on these ultra-low rolling resistance tires and technologies, uh, you see that, I mean, tires are 90% efficient. I mean, they're incredibly efficient. So. As the pressure goes up, you're improving the efficiency, but you're improving the efficiency of a very efficient uh, system already, okay? So that tire can, you know, run over the bumps in the road and deform and spring back, and it's doing it, call it 90% efficient. Now, as that becomes hard, too hard, uh, all of a sudden now you've got the whole bike is, is bouncing over all of those bumps, and with the bike bouncing, over those bumps, you have losses at the contact points. Think about your hands on the handlebars uh, being jostled against the bar, uh, high frequency vibration. You, the reason we wear gloves or you know, you want your super soft bar tape, um, and the reason you get blisters, right, is that that is from heat and vibration caused by uh, the, the high frequency vibration coming up from the road. Um, now think about the human body sitting on top of this system. A tire is 90% efficient. When the road is really rough and your body is shaking, the losses in your body are quite high. And we have, I think, a good analogy, but also some good study on this. So the, the US military has done a lot of study on the jostling of troops uh, in transports and tanks and aircraft. And what you find is that you know, people perform less well uh, when they're experiencing high frequency and or and or high frequency high amplitude vibration, um, people perform less well mentally when they are subject to what they call NVH noise vibration and harshness. This is a huge thing in automotive and aircraft uh, engineering. But also, people get hot when they experience vibration. And my uh, my sort of real world example that you may be familiar with is if you have ever run a jackhammer. Think about this. The operator of a jackhammer uh, experiences really, uh, other than the ringing of the ears and the, the numbness of the hands, the, the thing you notice the most when you jackhammer is that you pour sweat. Now let's think about this. When you are jackhammering, how much work are you really doing? As the human in this equation, you are pretty much there to hold the thing upright and hold the lever down and aim it right? You get hot because all of those large amplitude, relatively high frequency um, for the amplitude vibrations, come through your body and you are being shaken. All of that movement through your body, the muscles, the fat, the, the bone, all the uh, tendons and ligaments and cartilage and everything being jostled, all of these internal frictions, right? All of this internal rubbing is generating tons and tons of heat. And everywhere we're making heat, those are losses from the system. And so when you jackhammer, you sweat. <laughs> Probably it's like being in a sauna. Um, but you're really not doing any work, right? You're not burning a ton of calories jackhammering because you're pretty much holding it upright. So this is sort of what happens when we run too high a tire pressure. You get into this steep part of the curve over here. Um, and you see that you, the system actually becomes very asymmetrically inefficient. And so here's where we get to the power of having the knowledge of this asymmetry. Let's, let's look at the left side of our graph here, right, where the, the, uh, these losses are dominated still by the tire and the tire casing. Look at the, the deltas in watts or wattage 
uh, over a 5 and 10 PSI range. We're talking 1, 3, 4 watts, uh, maybe over 10 PSI on the low side. As that tire gets too hard and you're into the impedance side of the graph, right? Impedance being the, the shaking, the jostling. Um, being 10 PSI over could be 6, 8 watts more, right? And that's because shaking the human is far, far less efficient than vibrating the tire, right? So this is the kind of knowledge that it can become really important in making some of these race day decisions. You know, we still travel all over the world uh, doing tire pressure optimization for Olympics and world championships, and I think I'm at Paris-Roubaix every year. Uh, helping teams optimize this year's equipment, this year's tires, this year's riders, um, because knowing where to find that, that peak minimum right in there, that's what we call the break point, right? And being able to get into that break point pressure or as close as possible to it and be just on the low side uh, is really valuable. I mean, that can be worth, you know, more than a handful of watts. It can actually be worth uh, quite a few. Now, let's look at, let me put up some cobble data. There we go. And look at the cobble data. What's interesting about this is that it's asymmetric, but it only has the one side. And the reason for that is that we find over the cobbles, you start at a high pressure and you come down. And as we come down, the rider goes faster and faster and faster. And eventually the pressure gets so low that you break the wheels or you pinch flat the tire. Um, cobbles, the extreme Roubaix style cobbles are a really beautiful example um, of you know, what I like to call like the Icarus problem, right? How close can we fly to the sun um, without melting our wings? And in the case of Roubaix, you know, we typically want to know with, within, within about half a PSI to a tenth of a PSI um, how low we can go for that maximum speed and handling over the cobbles uh, without damaging the equipment. Because on the flip side of this, we know at a race like Roubaix, 250 plus kilometers, the added comfort and the reduced jostling of the human, right, of the rider on the bicycle also reduces the fatigue, uh, both the muscular fatigue and the mental emotional fatigue of the rider over the course of that race. And you think 250 plus kilometers, you know, 30 plus uh, sectors of pave, um, you know, even just being a couple percent more efficient over those cobbles with less uh, muscular fatigue and less mental fatigue can really reap some big benefits towards the end of the race. And so this is an area where, you know, we, we said in episode one, not all marginal gains are created equal. And you think in terms, or back to our sort of weight analogy, right? Being a little bit lighter is just a little bit better. But this is a beautiful, uh, I think, instance uh, where we can see that, you know, being just a little bit uh, more perfect on your tire pressure in a highly asymmetric environment uh, can actually have some really large rewards, both in terms of wattage, rider comfort, uh, fatigue, and all those things. So uh, with that, we will go ahead and wrap this episode. Uh, I hope I've got everybody thinking about asymmetry. Uh, there's so much more. That word's going to come up all the time, I think, as we get into uh, these next topics, um, which, by the way, n our next topic is another favorite, non-linearity. Uh, just as we tend to prefer things that are symmetric and think uh, and mentally model things as being symmetric, uh, we also tend to model them and think about them generally as being linear, even when they're not. And quite often, maybe most of the time, they're not. So, Thank you so much for listening, and I uh, look forward to seeing you next time.